Um, so everyone is always terrified of the last session of a conference. And it's, will anyone show up? Will you be talking to yourself? Will I be on a live stream with just myself and the chancellor? Um, which would be awkward, and Daniel is a, a lovely dude. Um, but I'm glad that some folks stuck around. If you're thinking about leaving, don't go. Let's, let's, let's maintain the numbers here. Um, there are snacks outside. The cheese is excellent. But anyhow, um, thank you for the introduction. I actually didn't expect to be introduced, so that is super. Um, I'm Brett. I'm a special advisor. And I never thought I would be giving a talk at, at this type of event, because this wasn't really my world. Um, I grew up in, so like, like one of the big things I did was I worked on a company, built a company called OpenTable. And OpenTable is as far from modern conflict as you can imagine. Like my big stress was Valentine's Day. Like, like well, it's an interesting problem. So academia, you need to work on this. Um, so the, the year is really predictable. With, with open table, right? Like everyone goes out to dinner on Friday, but then we created those dining rewards things, and we all got you to go to dinner on Tuesdays, which worked really well. People do anything for points. Um, forget that. But then you have Valentine's Day, and you have this insane spike, and it was super, super painful. So that was my old stress, um, but then I went to Department of Defense. So I was the Silicon Valley dude. Um, everything was great. And then with, to make a really long story short, I got a phone call. It's like, can you swing by the Pentagon? We hear you're in DC. One, what does that mean you hear I'm in DC? Um, two, where's the Pentagon? Um, so I found the Pentagon. I'm pretty good with the interwebs. And went in, and they're like, we want you to be a part-time advisor. OK. That's cool. So I'm like completely normal person in Chicago. Daniel and I are at University of Chicago. I'm a venture capitalist, and I'm a part-time advisor. Uh, but then I got recruited after a year and a half of doing that to run the Defense Digital Service. So you're like, that's a really boring like DOD name. Yeah, it is. We were the SWAT team of nerds. So that is how you should think about us. It was some of the most talented uh, technologists in our country, and absolutely amazing folks. Engineers to product folks, security folks, some are actually here today, thanks for support. Um, and we worked on wicked problems. And I learned so much about the national security space, because we like to say we, we fell into two buckets. It was, is something on fire? to something you just need your horde of awesome nerds, or is a capability we want to leapfrog? And for me, that was a boot camp for what are the real problems we need to think about. And as someone who grew up in another world, I was then able to understand real needs, real problems. So when we tie this together, and I guess I should get off my first slide. Ready? Oop. Great. The past couple days have been awesome. And like I know that's my job to say right now, and I have complete bias, but it's been awesome. Um, the idea that we could, so I grew up in the world of like tech conferences. So I went to Strata in the data science world. And I gave talks for years. Um, RSA, you know, all of these different conferences, which are different than what we did. The intent behind this was how can we bring together the very best in academics with people who are involved in the real issues every single day. And over the past couple days, we've seen some amazing folks. General Nakasone, who is at the head of so many critical issues, came and spent the day at Vanderbilt. And he gave the keynote, which many of you um, were here for. But then he continued on. He met with ROTC students. He met with the faculty, all sorts of folks. He took the fastest campus tour ever. Like, you know, there's this little block of time, and I'm like, dude, can you do turbo tour? And they just flew. It was great. Um, but then we had folks, you, you know, when I go around and I talk to my friends, and I'm like, what is the CNMF? No one knows. 
but we were able to learn more about that mission. But at the same time, we had these rock star panels. Uh, clearly, I have a bias on the interdisciplinary side because Daniel and I before created a dual degree in public policy and computer science. I love the idea of kids who can write Python but brief POTUS. That is a magical mix, and we need to be doing more of that. But then attribution yesterday, where you just had people who were doing real things, and you had academics challenging them and getting new ideas. That's the mix. A little less of the commercial side of it, sorry if I'm insulting anyone, but more of here are the issues. And something I really took from yesterday was Ethan's comments when we were comparing some of the work post 9-11 to some of the work now, and are, where are we being asked to help? Because I, I was over at the National Security Council recently, and I got the comment, we need more from academia. We are being posed with these new wicked problems. And that's an opportunity for us, because in academia, we have some of our best and brightest. And when we have where I woke up sort of living, living the DOD national security side is the real problems are out there. It was very enlightening. Um, I was over in Afghanistan multiple times. And it makes things super real. Like it's one thing to get on the interwebs and look at pictures, but when you're there and it's real and you see these problems that are that impactful, okay. Look at what's happening in the Ukraine. Like we had all of these folks who gave us perspective and we think about where can we plug in? And then we get to, wow, the former president of Estonia. Like, so, okay, I had sort of a nerd fan moment on that because I go to the PsyCon conference every year. Do people know PsyCon? Okay, I got like two. All right, so every year NATO has a conference called PsyCon and it's always in Estonia, it's always in Tallinn and it is the cyber meeting every year. And it's, uh, I heard her talk a couple of years ago and every year it's so inspirational to go and be like, yeah, we can work together. And yes, we've seen real things in Estonia and it grounds the threats. So having her here today and providing that view was awesome. And then for many of us, like Niels and I worked together on some COVID stuff when I was still at the DOD. Like we can't forget these new sort of topics, which I think others might argue they've been around for a while, um, but how are we gonna respond? And how are we gonna respond better to the next one? I bring a bit of that weird hybrid view where sometimes in DC we live in the moment. What is a heater of the day? What's gonna get you out of the news cycle? But the challenge with that is when it happens again and if we don't do better, that's bad on us. So it's critical as we see these new types of conflicts or these new types of threats that we actually learn from them and we don't forget and we say, how do we do better? Um, all of those different things. But you know, I'm, I'm not gonna mention every single great shot up there, which was I got help on this because it's harder to do in PowerPoint than you might think. Like, how do you get everyone to line up? Um, but okay, so I know technically I'm supposed to be like, okay, and thank you to everyone, thank you to Chancellor, we're wrapping up, go enjoy the rain. But for those of you that know me, there's a couple things I still wanna talk about and I can't resist that. So let's, let's talk about a couple things and my intent so a win for me is if I make you a little worried at the end of it. So let's talk about data. So one of the things that has been talked about in a variety of different ways are all of the pieces of data out there. We have everything from IoT to cloud infrastructure to for the love of Job, like every thermostat in my house has a chip. There is data everywhere. Now, the Silicon Valley side of me says, this is amazing opportunity. We are creating technology and we are innovating. The DOD national security side says surface area. And that's how do I secure it? How do I patch it? But then innovative Brett, who's, you know, the investor says, oh, okay, artificial intelligence. I'm gonna make my thermostat really smart. So 
how do we get at that friction? Now, if we put on my DOD lens, um, we are talking, one of the things you constantly hear is artificial intelligence and all of the different amazing things it can do. And this is just me playing on Google and ripping out the headlines and you know the I idea that you can inject AI into this and then we'll have some great decisions. Now, before you think you know what path I'm going down, okay, I think ML and AI is awesome, okay? I think we can solve, pro we are solving problems, we can do amazing things, but where I'm gonna kinda go is we need to do it right. We can't skip to the end, and sometimes you have people like me who wanna make really cool things, like I'm gonna hack up the code, but it's not necessarily constructed well. So in our national security space, AI can be a game changer. When we think of all of the sensors, all of the different pieces, how do we find the nugget? Um, you know, I just think of, you know, even from an OSINT perspective, how do you find the things you need to know and pull them out? But I worry about fragility. Right? So if you keep on using the Google machine, you start to find all of these things which could go potentially wrong, right? And, and you have sort of the negative side of AI. And are, is it gonna be vulnerable? Is it gonna be challenged? All of that. So I ran a test. So um, who here knows GPT-3? Come on, more than the last time. Okay, so there's something called OpenAI and then one of the models is called GPT-3. So I'm gonna come over here and we're gonna do this together because this is gonna be really fun. It, like the closer rule will work out. Um, so my, okay, so I have three kids and um, I have a 10, a 12, and a 14 year old and I'm pushing them all into languages. So I got onto GPT-3, I got a license for it, so I'm actively interacting with the AI. So I'm like, so I'm an old dude, but I feel like I can still write code, so it's complicated, and I actually did it. Um, so I started with a series of questions. What language should my 10-year-old learn, okay? So Aaron Abigail's super smart, and I needed the advice, and um, this is what the AI answered. So that is not me doing anything to it. That is the AI answer from GPT-3. And so Aaron is studying Chinese, so I actually think I'm a good dad, right? So, so far so good with the AI. Um, okay, here we go. So I'm trying, I'm always trying to figure out what to eat. So there you go. Don't eat pork, all this. You know, it seems a little healthy for me, but still a pretty reasonable answer from the AI. Okay, now this is when we get serious because you know, being involved with the summit, we had to decide what do we serve at the reception? And like, I was really good at the open table thing, but I'm not really good at event planning. Um, so I'm like, okay, so asked GPT-3 that question, came back, I feel like that's a little, like not the best of answers, but you could do it, right? Okay, so that's, that's good, GPT-3 is my friend. All right, so let's keep on going. Okay, so I knew I was gonna have to give a talk because no one wants to give the closer. So I asked GPT-3 for advice. I said, what should we talk about? And it, that seems like a reasonable answer. So we're still doing well. And then I asked it a hard one because I'm like, what would I ask General Nakasone? Things there. Now, now friends, right? We've done five questions. We all feel like they're pretty reasonable, right? Okay, so I decided to ask one more because I pivoted and then I broke it. So, because I flipped my intent from these questions to how can I deceive an AI? And this is what, what came up. And this is one of the better models out here. So, the, the piece I'm trying to get across to you is there are amazing things that are out there. And I was honestly, when I was asking for advice, like I'm sitting in the easy chair, I'm doing that, I I'm, I'm legitimately felt like I was getting amazing things. And then I started to have the dark intent and I'm like, where am I gonna find the corner case? And then it broke hard. And those are some of the things that we need to think about, both from a national security perspective, but also from an academic perspective. And how do we do that? Because 
it's all fun and games if I'm, you know, sitting there drinking my coffee, playing with GPT-3 at home in the middle of Wisconsin. It's another thing if I'm making a shoot decision. And then is the AI going to give me the right answer? And I'm probably a little more sophisticated in the space than your average person, but we need to make it understandable and we need to make it trustable. And how do we figure those out as we get toward the exciting things? Now, continuing on, um, okay, software. So we have lots of CS folks in, in the room. I worry about software fragility all day long. Now, and as someone who's contributed quite a bit of software, um, some of the things I've written aren't the best, and I'm sorry, and I apologize. But here's, you're, you're trying to figure out what are you looking at here? And um, so many of you may know Bruce Schneier's book, Applied Cryptography. And he talks, so in there, there's a foreword by Matt Blaze talking about the poor quality of software. And I apologize that you can't see the little highlighted line, but you can look it up. Um, and he talks about my exact worry. Software is fragile. We write crummy software, all of those different pieces. And so I'm saying this in 2022. Okay. So when was applied cryptography written? 1996. And there are many who would argue that not a lot has changed. And as we think about the calculus um, and we think about some of the issues that were discussed for more of the policy piece, every day, enormous amount of code is written. You know, people are constantly re releasing software, and that's something we pride our innovation, where you heard someone else mentioned um, it would be easier to protect the code if it were more homogenous, my words. But our innovation says, let's generate more and more software. There's a friction there. How do you reconcile that? If nothing's really changed in 25 plus years, and Bruce Schneier, you, you know, he's still vocal today, this is something we need to figure out because the surface area continues to grow and it creates um, the asymmetry between the offender and the defender. Now, other pieces that are worth thinking about that get a little less um, discussion is the physical layer. So you're like, oh my God, what am I looking at now? So you're looking in the top at the Ukraine. Now, it's a map of fiber in the Ukraine because you can get on the interwebs and you can look at where the fiber lines are. Now, some people, you, you know, you think about the internet, you're thinking about your computer, your device, um, your TV. But at the end of the day, it comes to the fiber. And the way that the backbone of the internet works is you have all of these cables, they go into these routers and magical things happen and they go back and forth. But when you look at the Ukraine, for example, you see a few lines there and they are really physical. And you have an example of this is what a line, this is an above ground line and what it looks like. So something we haven't really considered that much in the conflict space is what does this physical layer, how does that play into it? And who controls the lines and where the traffic would go? Um, there was an article in Bloomberg a couple weeks ago talking about could the internet segment? Um, and I think, and I'll be a little nerdy for a second, you know, the article was thinking about layer three, layer four. But when we take it down to that physical layer, what does that mean in conflict and how will that all work? And then you start to think about general fragility. Um, so Nashville knows um, the Christmas bombing. And this was a case, and you know we have members from law enforcement here, where you have this interesting intersection between a kinetic act and a cyber act, um, where the kinetic explosion was, it just took it down. And when you think about the overall architecture and the, and the stack, um, where are points of our exposure? Where is the fragility? And what else does it break? And these are types of things which are often really boring. Like who wants to go to a conference and talk about cabling and infrastructure? But I can promise you, sometimes one little cable, massive, massive impact. 
how does that fit in from a defensive and an offensive perspective? And then beyond that, there are other points of fragility. I just, I couldn't resist the example on the right where someone shot a cable. Like one, I guess good aim if there was intent, um, but the bullet took out Oakland and the internet and all of the different pieces. And when I think about the stack on top of that, think of everything that breaks. And get back to my earlier example of how my house works. Like, I think I have like 50 IP addresses beyond my network. And it's really, it's not like stacks of servers. It's just like kids and thermostats and every TV and all of those different pieces. Okay, but then we took out the cable and then everything stops working. Like it's always interesting. I guess we were talking about ovens. What are you gonna do when your oven doesn't have the interwebs and you can't make dinner? Interesting problems from the physical layer. But then uh, other pieces are vendors. Um, how do we think about, as you think about routing and how the underbelly works, you have these vendors who control the various pieces. And I know, having broken many things in my life, you're often one firmware away from what I would call technical term bricking um, a device and everything stops. So how do you think about the vendor play? Um, you got a little bit of this yesterday with, with touching on like the dib supply, but the general piece, bad pieces of software can go ahead and change to the things, they stop working, physical layer, layers above. So that was all cheery, but okay, be before we all go off boot shopping, because I think Collier is still gonna be offering his boot tour of Nashville, um, a couple other things I'd, I'd ask you to ponder. Um, so they were actually trying to convince me to wear boots with a suit, and I, like, I chickened out at the end, but my hope is next year, that can be my big goal. Okay. So, okay, it's a beautiful visual. So good job to the designers. But this is giving you a sense, and I borrowed this image from Nilu um, that she used for a different talk. This is two weeks of information flow about the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Can you imagine trying to make sense of this? And it is overwhelming. When we think about the amount of data and getting back to some of our other themes, enormous data, enormous information, misinformation, artificial intelligence. Can I trust my AI? All of those different pieces. The soup is getting very complicated. But again, this falls very nicely into academic partnerships. How can we help develop new ways where it, instead of just growing it each year with more and more data, what are the leapfrog capabilities there? And I think most folks got this from the discussion yesterday. Let's see if the animation works. Okay, so this is one of many tools out there that provides um, a visualization of real-time cyber attacks. And this gets at a couple themes. One, um, maybe I should have made it longer, but beyond that, um, there's an enormous amount of activity going on, but if you go back to the attribution panel yesterday, who's doing what? Like, it's, it's super easy when you look at it to be like, okay, country X, country Y. But when we peel back some of the lessons from yesterday, um, do you know who's really doing what? And Rob and the whole team gave an excellent answer of how you break down attribution, but think about its scale. Like if we go back and we start to say, um, enormous information coming from all over the place, how are we going to make sense of it? Because it's very much a needle in a haystack. These are interesting problems where I think many in the space would say, Finding that just-in-time information is critical, but we're starting to challenge ourselves with that much information. Now, I alluded to this before, um, and I, I feel like I use the balloon analogy all the time. I feel like we write more and more software, 
we create more and more systems, and the balloon just continues to get bigger. And the defender needs to worry about this balloon. You're like, oh, don't prick me. Um, but for the offender, it is find the pinprick. And again, more and more software, I just need to find one way in. And I think this is an interesting problem for us all to look at because it's so extremely asymmetric. Like if you said, hey, Brett, which side do you want to be on? I'd be like, let me be the offender all day long. And for people who have worked defense, it, and there are people in the room who do that, it never, ever ends. And you're just one zero day away from a really, really terrible day. Interesting problem. How can we be helpful with that? Now, this is something which has, you, you know, there's some talk about now. Um, we talk about various models of deterrence. How do we, um, some of our friends yesterday spoke to the various deterrents that may be occurring and, and you, you know, who's using one. I think there's an interesting academic question to, to try and figure out where does it go? Now, if you buy in at all to my premise that we are gonna continue to be innovative and make more and more software and not necessarily be secure in it because our track record isn't awesome, like I'm still getting my mom to patch her machine and good God, two-factor authentication, like mom, come on. Um, that's the path we're on. So as we think about conflict at the nation state level, where does that go? Do we continue to have various engagements or is there a model where we can think about some sort of um, strong deterrent option? Now, we figured out a model on the nuclear side. Okay, good job. And academia played a huge role in that. I think a question for us going forward is, what could be a model which could bring greater deterrence to the system? And that is something I don't know if anyone's really cracked that. And that's something we should be thinking more about. And then to tie it up, I think we all know, and hopefully the past couple days were educational um, in this regard, there's real work to be done. The sense I'm getting is there's a real appetite from partners to, to find ways to get at these, what I would call, wicked problems. And we can bring the very best in academia, and then we can have strong partners and work on both great theoretical work, but also ways to apply it. So, because I am actually gonna wind this up as the closer, um, there's a lot of, a lot of folks who um, came to our first summit. And I very much appreciate all the agencies that came from various media outlets, um, throughout the national security apparatus. Uh, for those of you who aren't tracking, this was a 90-day surge. And it is amazing to see everyone that came. It tells me that there's signal for collaboration. And that is super exciting. But before we close for reals, I want to thank Team Vanderbilt. Um, we were given a challenge from the chancellor to make this happen, and it has been a whirlwind of activity. Um, there's lots of people to thank. I listed out a bunch of groups. Um, I want to make sure we thank our summit moderators, Dave yesterday, Jen today. Thank you for doing that. If you heard me all day, every day, it would be absolutely terrible. And one particular person I want to call out is Jolie Grace, who, um, yes, yeah. See, it's, I think everyone in the room knows Jolie Grace and why we were clapping. Uh, so with that all being said, uh, on behalf of the chancellor, I thank you for coming. We're looking forward to doing this again. We very much want your feedback. We want your ideas. We want to know how to challenge ourselves and um, figure out what are the wicked problems we're gonna work on. So thank you very much and have a good rest of your day.